Well, we'd love to interact with you, and we want to take some time to answer some of the questions that you've submitted to us. And Pat, this first one comes from Alexis, who says, Pat, I agree with you about the law of greatness. I think humility and having a servant's heart are qualities that are sorely lacking in today's age, especially in Washington. But how can a true servant really lead? There may come a time when two people have two very different opinions about how to approach a topic. How can a leader serve both when he's expected to make an either-or decision? Well, uh, the whole thought is you approach it that you are a servant. Your job is to serve and make a better situation for your company, for your state, for your nation, and that's your heart. And people might disagree with you, but Jesus Christ was a leader, and he he spoke what's to be done, and and uh, he he obviously was there. He loved the people and. As a leader, you love the people, and if somebody disagrees with you, you hear hear their point of view. You listen respectfully to what they have to say, and you listen to both sides, and they know that you have to make a decision, and they need to respect your decision if you are a leader. And uh, the decision you make is you say, I, I hope you all agree, but I do believe this is the best course. We've listened to all the arguments. and. We have to make a decision, yeah. but you do it humbly. You, you don't just say, "Look, I'm the boss. You do what I say, whether you like it or not." I mean, it's, a, it's, it's, your, it's your attitude. I love you. I want to do what's best, and here's what I think's right, and then everybody needs to fall in line. But that—that's—that's—that's that's, that's leadership. It's love. All right. Okay. This is from. Tommy. Tommy says, I really want to make a difference in the world and do big things for Christ. I believe that I need to have a servant's heart in order to do that. But I feel as if my emotions are in flux. I truly do want to serve. But at the same time, I realize that my motivation for serving is tied into my desires for greatness. How do I reconcile these feelings? Uh, don't spend so much time in introspection. It'll drive you nuts. <laughs> I mean, really. I mean, <laughs> Just get out there and help somebody. Yeah. You know, d d don't say, well, what's my motivation for this? I mean, these people are poor. They need food. Let's get some food to them. Period. You know, this business about, you know, I'm looking at my pulse and I'm feeling, you know, what, what is my motivation? Forget all that. You focus on the need. How can I meet the need? What can I do to serve these people? Period. Yeah, it's, there's some wonderful scriptures for that too, where you're asking God to help you. You yeah. know, create in me a pure heart, and and God does that in us for yeah, us when our motives are to please and you serve. You can do that, but again, Terry, this this introspection, you know, uh, you can spend all it's your time. True. Well, are my motives right? Am I doing this for the right motive? Blah blah. blah. I mean, come on. You, you know, who cares about right now what your motive is? The, the motive he's got to do is let's get the job done. Mm -hmm. Here's here here are people who are suffering. Let's help them. Okay. Okay, this is Sharon who says, I just started watching your show and I love it. I've had a rough life. I lost one of my sons when he was just 19 years old. Just four months later, my husband of 22 years passed away. Jesus has been my rock through this and he is my highest priority in my life. I have a beautiful statue of Jesus carrying his cross. I keep it in front of me above my TV in full sight. A viewer wrote and asked you about man-made idols. You said we're never to worship graven images or man-made idols of any kind. Mm -hmm. I agree, but since then I've been doubly troubled about my, deeply troubled about my statue. I don't bow down or worship it, but it brings me such strength now that I'm a widow and alone. Is this considered an idol? Well, it depends on what you've done in your life. I mean, if this is an example, I mean, we've got a picture, I think, on the other side of the studio of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, I sure. mean, but well, there are many, many um, sculptures. Well, gee, that sure. have been done by wonderful artists but, over the years. Uh, you go into St. Peter's and there are people who are rubbing the feet of some statue of a saint thinking it's going to bring them blessing. Mm -hmm. That's idolatry. On the other hand, you say, I want to follow the example of this one who carried his cross to Calvary for me. And I want to. I want to be. He did it for me, and I love him because of it. That's that's not idolatry. That's 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 an example, mm -hmm. and it's not. It could be written in a really. text. Mm -hmm. It's presented in a piece of sculpture. I, I don't. I don't consider that idolatry.
Right. Okay, this is David who says we're giving approximately 18% of our income, but it's divided among several ministries. We're giving to our local church, but only about 8 to 9%. Is it necessary to up the local church to 10% to consider that we are tithers? We're not currently contributing 10% to any one organization, or am I overthinking this? <laughs> yes, you're overthinking it. You know, God is not a Philadelphia lawyer. He is not uh, a, a <laughs> big right. six yes. accountant. I mean, come on. You know, we, 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 we diminish the, 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 the Creator. He is a great God, and He says, you know, I love you, and out of that which I've given, you give back. And the ten, tenth is only one. There were three tithes, if you look in the Old Testament. So, you know, the, the, the standard is 30 percent. Some, the, the government lets you give 50 percent. It just depends. I mean, tithes and offerings out of, your, out of your, your inner being. But it doesn't have to be to a, quote, church. You know, I know there's something that tithe belongs to the church. No, it doesn't. It belongs to God. Yeah. And um, if it's a ministry of helps, that the humanitarian and something else, you're giving to God. And that's what he's concerned about. It's what's in your heart. Deep calls to deep. And I, I think we, we've got to get out of this, uh, you know. Well, there's something in us that so wants to please that we want a, a formula so that yeah, we can Yeah, I know. Follow, but, but he doesn't want us to have formulas. <laughs> I know. I agree He with doesn't you. want us. He wants it's us to be free. Attitude. Freedom. Yes. Okay. Okay. This is Rachel who says, why does God heal some and not others? Does the phrase no respecter of persons apply here? How can we have complete faith that God will do something when in actuality we really can't say for certain what he'll do? You know, Catherine Kuhlman had a great ministry of healing, and she said when she gets to heaven, she's going to ask God uh, that question, so yes. he shall get an answer. Why do some people get healed, some don't? What's in their heart? You know, there isn't. They they talk about uh, uh, holy invalids, but you don't know what's going on in their heart. Is there resentment way down deep inside? Is there lack of faith deep inside? Uh, is there their time hasn't quite come. You don't know. God, in His infinite wisdom, knows all these things, and He hasn't revealed them all to us. When Jesus was here on earth, He knew if something was demons. He knew if something was sin. He knew if something was just disease. And He was able to deal with all those problems, and then everybody got healed. There was no person who came to Jesus who wasn't healed. So they know, and we don't know. We see through a glass darkly. But Even God's bigger plan. You know, I think of the story of Jim Elliot. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. we see death differently than, than God does. And that, was, that created such a broad spreading of the gospel. Absolutely. And, Out I of mean, uh, it, it, what was to us was a tragedy, was a glorious uh, affirmation of faith. You're I right. I think Jim Elliot knew that too. <laughs> yeah. But his wasn't, a, he wasn't sick and healing. But I mean, he was, you know, right. he got killed. But is that bad? Not really. He's with the Lord.